Good evening. I'm uh, Jerome Lagos, the Vice President and Chief Academic Officer at Thomas More. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Wilbert L. and Ellen Hackman Ziegler Endowed Chair in Philosophy talk, which will be delivered in just a few moments by Monsignor Gerald Twadell from the yes Department of Philosophy and Political Science. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Will and Ellen Hackman Ziegler for their generosity in bestowing Thomas More University with its first endowed chair. Their gift testifies to a deep commitment to philosophy as integral to a liberal arts education and the Catholic intellectual tradition. I would also like to thank the Department of Philosophy and Political Science for planning the event and of course Monsignor Trudell for his stimul stimulating reflections, which we will hear in a few moments, on the meaning of courage and failures of courage. Uh, Reverend Gerald E. Twadell has been a member of the philosophy department at Thomas More uh, University since 1977, received his doctorate in philosophy from the Catholic University of Paris, also holds graduate degrees in French and in theology. Though he teaches a wide range of topics, he is particularly interested in value theory and ethics. He also serves as chaplain in the university and has been a parish pastor. Please join me in welcoming uh, Monsignor today. Good evening. For those of you who are sitting towards the back, uh, you're welcome to come forward. Uh, it might be a little easier to see the slides. Uh, the next slide has a long text on it, so uh, you, I will turn around and read it, but uh, it's fun. So the whole question here is, what comes to mind when you hear the word courage? Would you be able to describe some examples of courageous action? And most of us, I think, would feel confident that we could answer both of those questions in the affirmative, and we would, like, would likely expect that everyone else would confirm our examples. Now, we might be very surprised, though, if someone offered examples that didn't seem to fit our understanding, and yet we might, to our chagrin, not be able to explain why those examples should be rejected. And here is an interesting uh, item that I found a while back. And I thought, this is a perfect way to start thinking about this. So the tour guide is saying to the uh, people on the tour bus, and here's the battlefield where one of my forefathers was engaging in a brutal war and fled for his life, which is why I'm alive today. Actually, most of our ancestors were cowards. They tend to live longer. So cowards and the courageous, that's the question we're going to have to think about. So we might begin to suspect that something is off target in someone's thinking about courage, either in our own or in someone else's. Of course, we'll be inclined to think it must be someone else who's mistaken. Chances are that the discomfort we feel issues from the idea that courage always ought to be a purely good thing. When some example is raised that seems to be tainted in some way, especially morally, we don't want to call it courage. And yet, maybe we don't have a handy label to give it. We end up uh, feeling disoriented, or alternatively, we may simply give up and expand the range to which we apply the word courage. Shortly, we need to look into some concrete examples, but let me just say at this point that what I want to try to show in this talk is that uh, is what I'm calling failures of courage, examples that are confusing to many people, and so they may mistakenly be put in the category of courageous action when on closer examination they should not be. Part of our task will be to sort out how those confusions arise and why we may have a hard time getting clear about them. Another part of the task, far more difficult, will be to change people's minds 
so that they could be identified as actual acts of cowardice. To put the matter bluntly, why have we come to honor acts of cowardice as courageous? More disturbingly, why do we teach people to be cowards under the guise of courage? Why do we tolerate or even reward behaviors that should be condemned as, at the very least, antisocial? The word we is being used here in perhaps too broad a way, but if we silently let things pass that should be denounced, we become complicit in the charade. It's time to face the fact that, for example, people regularly resort to violence when they have a disagreement with someone and believe sincerely that they are just being courageous. Or maybe they might say brave. Where do they learn to think that way? That's no different from thinking of any terrorist, pol political or religious, who comes to that same conclusion. Why should it matter what kind of entitlement someone invokes to hide their cowardice? Their action is still not justified. Why did no one educate them to recognize the difference between true courage and abject cowardice? Or is there no difference after all? Therein lies part of the confusion, perhaps even the heart of it. So, make sure I've got the right slide here. So that's my introduction. And so we're moving now into a contemporary reflection on courage. Uh, in his small treatise on the great virtues, the uses of philosophy in everyday life, the highly respected contemporary French philosopher André Consponville uh, explores a number of the oddities connected with our thinking and speaking about courage. From the start, he points out that while courage is universally admired and cowardice despised, there's something strange going on because that means that the wicked and fools also make the same judgments. Should their views really matter? The next oddity is that courage seems to be able to serve purposes that may be either good or evil, raising the question, is the courage to do evil even something we ought to call courage? It begins to look as though there may be an excellence here, but one that is neither moral nor immoral in itself. As a mental experiment, Consponville asks his reader to imagine two terrorists who engage in the same act, namely blowing up an airplane full of travelers, each with the same motive and producing the same consequences. But one of them chooses not to risk his own life by boarding the plane, whereas the other does. The one who takes no risk would be judged a coward. But does that mean the other is courageous? The self-sacrifice of the second one suggests some kind of selflessness. Perhaps that's the element that inclines people to categorize his act as courageous, or at least brave. But let's look more closely. This supposed act of selflessness may be driven by a selfish motive to achieve some sort of spiritual or at least non-material reward, whether in this life or after death. As Comte Sponville observes, selfish courage is still selfishness. The admixture of a vice should negate the possibility of calling the act courageous, shouldn't it? Ponsponville's analysis thus far suggests to him that what we find morally worthy of respect and courage, he says, is first of all, the acceptance or incurring of risk without selfish motivations. In other words, a form, if not always of altruism, then at least of disinterestedness, detachment, or distancing from the self. But this observation raises further issue. What if a person is attacked and defends him or herself vigorously rather than pleading for mercy. Clearly, the act of self-defense is not at all disinterested or detached. Does that mean the person is not courageous? 
Surely most would deem the act glorious from a psychological or sociological point of view, but glory is neither morality nor virtue. Courage, he claims, is only really morally estimable when at least partially in the service of others and more or less free of immediate self-interest. Interestingly, this leads to a conclusion that the highest form of courage for an atheist would have to be courage in the face of death, since there could be no ulterior self-interest from the atheist viewpoint in a reward beyond death. The crucial point that Constantville arrives at is that finding pleasure in serving others uh, well, and well-being in acting generously, far from calling altruism into question, is its very definition and the principle of virtue. The others in question, of course, may not be specific persons. For remaining anonymous, they may be served in the pursuit of a great cause. A major claim the author wishes to make is this. As a character trait, courage is primarily a low sensitivity to fear, either because it is minimally felt or because it is easily or even pleasurably withstood. This is the courage of daredevils, of the cool-headed, of those who love a fight, the courage of tough guys. And we all know what such courage, that such courage may have nothing virtuous about it. This remark and his ensuing discussion uh, of what he dubs purely physical and self-serving courage goes to the heart of what I wish to call failures of courage. There's a mixture of vice, morally speaking, with the sort of mastering one's fears, which might even masquerade as temperance or moderation, were it not vitiated in the strict moral sense by its self-serving motive. Here he suggests that Kant would have called it pathological courage. Descartes would term it passionate courage. The example Comte-Sponville proposes is that of robbing a bank, which obviously involves danger and therefore requires overcoming fear, but it is not for that reason moral, or at any rate would require very special circumstances to become so. For this reason, he goes on to explain, virtuous courage certainly does not rule out a certain insensibility to fear or even a certain relish for it but it does not presuppose it. This kind of courage is not the absence of fear, but the capacity to overcome it by a stronger and more generous will. It is no longer or no longer just physiology. It is fortitude, moral strength in the face of danger. It is no longer a passion. It is a virtue, one that is the precondition of all the others. It is no longer the courage of the tough, it is the courage of the gentle and of heroes. The courage of the tough, of the daredevil, is nothing else but a form of that rashness which opposes the virtue of courage just as truly as cowardice. Why then is the courage of the gentle sometimes mistaken for cowardice? The answer may lie in the ambiguous role of hope. As Constantville observes, contrary to what Aristotle claimed, as we'll see later, courage in the face of death is not the greatest form of courage, because death is not the worst thing there is. Worse than death is unending suffering, prolonged horror, both immediate and terribly present. We must acknowledge that courage can be needed in this kind of present not just for a future about which one may have both fear and hope. Hence, hoping to be courageous in the future is not courage. Hope does not constitute courage, though it may strengthen it. Whether someone has hope or not, one can still have courage. Indeed, the one without hope may possess the highest form of courage. In the end, without hope or passion, or any other such support, courage can live, but the one thing that courage cannot do without is moderation. The ancient term for this was temperance. Today, we might also call it self-control. We should not be surprised because, as Aristotle insisted, all the cardinal virtues are interconnected, 
one cardinal virtue cannot stand authentically by itself. Moderation, courage, or fortitude, and justice are interdependent. And all three, in turn, rely on prudence, practical wisdom, without which they could never discover the, what Aristotle calls the mean, the midpoint. They could never discern the right thing for a human being to do. Comte's Bonville puts the matter this way. Without prudence, the other virtues would be blind or mad. Without courage, they would be futile or pusillanimous. Without prudence, the just person would lack the means to combat injustice. Without courage, he wouldn't dare take on the fight. In the former instance, he wouldn't know what steps to take to attain his goal. In the latter, he would retreat before the risks involved. Hence, the imprudent and the cowardly can't be just. They cannot act justly with true justice. All virtue is a form of courage, and all virtue is a form of prudence. We might want to amend that last point. Perhaps it would be more helpful to say that all virtue is an implementation of prudence. Prudence makes the practical judgment about what a human being ought or ought not to do. That judgment needs to be put into action. There is another sort of virtue called art or skill that concerns us concerns itself with how to do well the right thing for a human being. For instance, prudence may instruct us that justice calls for telling someone a painful truth. Art shows us the way to convey that truth in the least painful manner compatible with justice. In other words, with compassion. We can be grateful for Cosmovia's reflections on courage and still wish for additional clarification his exploration of how courage can seem to be needed to carry out either good or evil purposes suggests that our vocabulary is deficient, and perhaps we need a different term for what he terms bad courage. One angle to explore, explore would be the contributions of both moderation and prudence in moving to action. They each address the manner in which human beings respond to their emotions. The failure of the person to attend to practical reason or to practice the virtue of moderation consistently in life may account for the person's misdirection of psychological effort into the pursuit of unsuitable activities such as bank robbery. There is, after all, an effort required for the pursuit of any purpose, good or bad. The practical judgment concerning the purpose may be deflected by recasting the goal in terms of a self-interested description of the need to carry out the deed. That self-interested element would vitiate the act, make it a vice, whatever it might be. But dare we call it cowardly? Though that is an antonym of courageous, it's not the usual description. In fact, there may simply not be an adequate word. Aristotle already in his time acknowledged that there are virtues as well as vices for which he did not have a word in Greek. There's another perplexity, perhaps the basic one, in the fact that Aristotle framed his discussion of courage for the most part in reference to warfare. As soon as we attempt to move into a non-military context, the discussion becomes more difficult, and he shows that. Comte-Sponville helpfully cited Cicero's description of courage as the deliberate facing of dangers and bearing of toils, which definitely broadens the scope of courage's value. Aristotle's basic view is that the emotion that courage must deal with is fear. But what is fearsome about toil? Is it the threat <coughs> of not being able to complete the task? It is a fear that, no matter how much effort one can put forth, the task will never be finished. Interestingly, raising of these sorts of questions opens the possibility that Aristotle may have been correct, but simply left to his reader the investigation of different types of fears that may need to be overcome by courage. Surely what Cicero recognized is that persistence in the face of toil is an example of courage at work. 
in both senses of the word work. If we can speak of fear, it must be something like fear of failure rather than fear of death. To advance our present purpose, we need to attempt to gain insight into how Aristotle thought through the virtue of courage. So let's now turn to that task. Make sure I'm where I want to be. Yes, okay. So Aristotle's teaching on courage. Most anyone who has ever heard about Aristotle's thinking on virtue would remember that he said that virtue stands in the middle <clears throat> between two extremes, too much and too little. Another nugget of information might be the example of the virtue of courage as the mean between the vices of rashness and cowardice, audacity and timidity. <clears throat> Beyond that, few people could tell much more about how he arrived at the notion that a virtue is a mean, or what he had to say about courage beyond its opposition to those two vices, nor what other virtues he explored. To form a better understanding about Aristotle's theory of the virtues, we definitely should explore at least those first two ideas. As suggested at the end of the previous conference, part of the conference, uh, Aristotle's central issue in discussing courage or bravery, uh, the two are almost inter used interchangeably, is the degree of fear a person experiences, or more specifically, a fear of personal death, with, which he conceives as the ultimate fear, the most extreme case one could experience, he thinks. The question we need to ask is whether other sorts of fears or anxieties can be seen in that same light, that is to say, as needing to be managed by courage. As we will see, one very suggestive angle that Aristotle does mention is that honor might be lost if one does not act courageously. Maintaining one's honor in his world was a fundamental concern in his society. So, to begin, what led Aristotle to think that a virtue is a mean between extremes? Already in the first book of the Nicomachean Ethics, where he was working through a definition of good, Aristotle suggested that living a life of virtue is the way to fulfill one's ergon, or function, proper to a human being integrating both philosophical wisdom and understanding with practical wisdom, in other words, prudence, to achieve the highest good, which has traditionally been called happiness. More helpfully today, a term like flourishing or thriving would be better. We are, after all, rational animals, so both aspects, rational and animal, need to be involved in leading a well-balanced life. Our need for that balance further indicates the importance of having enough, but neither too much nor too little, of whatever allows us to fulfill or exercise our various human capacities. Let me take a mundane example. Picture someone wanting a piece of toast for breakfast. The slice of bread needs a certain amount of heat applied to it for the right length of time to make it a proper piece of toast. Too little heat or too little time may yield only a pale, slightly brownish, dry slice of bread. On the other hand, too much heat and too much time will rush past the point where the slice would have just the golden brown color and the exact texture that would fulfill its capacity to be a pleasant part of the meal. And the result instead is a disappointing, unpalatable cinder. This is not the sort of example Aristotle himself used, but it bears a resemblance to his form of reasoning. We might have wanted Aristotle to arrange his material in a different order. His concern, though, is to lead the reader along a path that starts from what allows a human being to flourish, and hence to understand what being human involves, both rational and irrational aspects, and then to acknowledge what virtue will have to do with the interaction of those different aspects, 
with the result that some virtues will be seen as being intellectual, namely philosophic wisdom, understanding, and practical wisdom, or prudence, mentioned already, and the others being moral, such as liberality and temperance. So to move into book two, uh, where he talks about these intellectual and moral virtues in general, in the first two chapters, uh, Aristotle shows how intellectual virtues are acquired through teaching, while moral virtues result from repeating behaviors according to a right rule of conduct until they become habits, or perhaps more helpfully, states of character. He uses that phrase also. Since it would be counterproductive to repeat an inappropriate behavior, we have to discover what Aristotle called the right rule to follow. This is where Aristotle's discussion becomes especially interesting, for he immediately points out that in matters of conduct, we cannot expect to get a precise rule or directive. Instead, we must make do with, quote, what is appropriate to the occasion, unquote, as suggested by examples from the arts of medicine and navigation. In both of these, there are so many factors that converge in any situation that a single narrow rule might actually be disastrous rather than helpful. It is in this context that we encounter the notion that Aristotle wished to make clear. He says, first then, let us consider this, that it is the nature of such things to be destroyed by defect and excess, as we see in the case of strength and of health. For to gain light on things imperceptible, we must use the evidence of sensible things. Both excessive and defective exercise destroys the strength, and similarly, drink or food which is above or below a certain amount destroys the health while that which is proportionate both produces and increases and preserves it. So too it is then in the case of temperance and courage and the other virtues. Shortly we'll look more closely at courage, but first we should pay attention to some details in what Aristotle is setting out here. Take the issue of food and drink in relation to health. It should be clear that there cannot be a single simple rule for how much every person must consume. Some are tall, some are short, some are very active, some are sedentary. While Aristotle would never have heard of calorie counting, he understood perfectly well that there is a range to be considered. And he makes the point explicit when he uses the terms right amount of food or drink, proportionate. Proportionate to what? Things like that individual's size, shape, and so on. In other words, it is a question of what is appropriate to the occasion, that is, to the concrete factors at play, height, weight, age, activity level, and so on. Apply the same thought process to strength, and his point about exercise holds the same implication. What is suitable to a young child will differ from what is proportionate to a young adult, which will vary also from what is suitable for an elderly person. The question of the proportionate range, then, cannot be left out of our understanding of Aristotle's discussion of virtues, especially those he's examining at this point in the text. At the same time, we must not be misled into thinking that he is advancing a relativistic ethics. The proportion he speaks about relates real things to one another. Therefore, it is an objectively grounded proportion, not a subjective preference. So let's see what else he says in that paragraph that we was just, were just citing. For the man who flies from and fears everything and does not stand his ground against anything becomes a coward. And the man who fears nothing at all but goes to meet every danger becomes rash. And similarly, the man who indulges in every pleasure and abstains from none becomes self-indulgent, while the man who shuns every pleasure, as boors do, becomes in a way insensible. Temperance and courage then are destroyed by excess and defect, 
and preserved by the mean. The limits of excess and defect are framed here in terms of all versus nothing, fear of everything versus fear of nothing, flee from every danger versus flee no danger. Cowardice versus rashness begin to sound like absolute conditions. But it's important to recall that in the case of strength and health, we noticed a proportion with respect to the mean. The implication is that there is going to be a gradation across the mean, which will shade over into the relevant extremes. Some may be a bit rash or slightly cowardly without lacking some degree of courage. Some may be slightly self-indulgent and others a bit boorish without completely lacking temperance, that is moderation. This may not be the only point about Aristotle's treatment of courage and temperance that deserves to be explored further. As he ends chapter two, Aristotle remarks that the sources of these virtues, as well as their growth and their destruction, are to be found in the same activities or behaviors. In the case of strength, the taking of food and much exertion enable a person to become strong, but too much or too little of either food or exertion lead to physical weakness, or in some other combination, perhaps to obesity. When shifting his imagery to the virtues, Aristotle asserts that temperance is developed by abstaining from certain pleasures, and that by being habituated to despise things that are terrible and to stand our ground against them, we become brave. And it is when we have become so that we should be most able to stand our ground against them. The third chapter of Book Two clarifies Aristotle's central claim that moral excellence is concerned with pleasures and pains. It is on account of the pleasure that we do bad things and on account of the pain that we abstain from noble ones, he says. Given that moral excellence just is virtue, Aristotle is convinced that the motivations that lead people to act always represent responses to pleasures and pains. And for that reason, virtues and vices are concerned with the same things. It's the appearance of attraction, he assures us, that makes even the noble and the advantageous appear pleasant. Nor does this necessarily exclude consideration of the possibility that those noble and advantageous things might demand extra effort, which could seem to involve some sort of pain. Because as Aristotle insists, even the good is better when it is harder. I'm not sure I agree with that, but that's what he says. Another concern that Aristotle has, which might not occur to us today, is what sort of a reality virtue is, into what genus it falls. Later on in chapter five, he observes that a soul can have three kinds of things in it, namely passions, of which he specifies appetite, anger, fear, confidence, and envy, joy, friendly feeling, hatred, longing, emulation, pity, and in general, the feelings that are accompanied by pleasure or pain. And secondly, faculties, or capacities for feeling the passions. And thirdly, states of character, uh, by which we stand well or badly with reference to the passions. By process of elimination, he concludes that since virtues and vices involve choice, they cannot simply be passions, nor can they be faculties, since people are not judged good or bad, simply by reason of having capacities for feeling emotions. All that is left is for virtues and vices to be states of character. Specifically, a virtue is a state of character concerned with choice lying in a mean. That is, the mean relative to us. This being determined by a rational principle and by that principle by which the man of practical wisdom would determine. determine it. That all is a quote from Aristotle. And it's probably not quite what many people think he said. Of course, when it comes to actions and passions, some can never have a mean because they are named in a way that implies badness. Passions such as spite, shamelessness, and envy can never be good. And actions such as adultery, theft, and murder similarly are always thought to be bad. 
While he doesn't mention any, it should be clear that there are also passions and actions whose name indicates that they are always good, such as joy and kindness. Against that backdrop, Aristotle makes some help, helpful observation about courage and connects it with temperance. He tells us, tells us that with regard to feelings of fear and confidence, courage is the mean. Of people who exceed, he who exceeds in fearlessness has no name. Many of the states have no name. While the man who exceeds in confidence is rash. And he who exceeds in fear and falls short in confidence is a coward. With regard to pleasures and pains, not all of them, and not so much with regard to the pains, the mean is temperance, the excess, self-indulgence. Persons deficient with regard to the pleasures are not often found, hence such persons also have received no name, but let's call them insensible. I need to check my thing here. Okay. So chapter seven, is where he's presenting an overview of how to think about the mean in a variety of applications. A few of these have a bearing on the understanding of courage. He talks about liberality and magnificence that hardly matter, but honor and the nameless mean between ambition and indifference deserve a quick glance since Aristotle has raised the point that a person might be motivated to be courageous by a desire for honor, or at least from the fear of dishonor. The mean in the pursuit of honor, he claims, is what one translator, W.D. Ross, in A Bow to Modern Attitudes, renders proper pride. The two opposed extremes are empty vanity, the excess, and undue or false humility, the defect. The other piece of his account notes that the desire for honor can be too great, in which case we call such a person ambitious while the one who is deficient in a desire for honor, we term indifferent or even lazy. We'll see shortly how a desire for honor may intersect with courage and its extremes. Chapters eight and nine acknowledge that people sometimes confuse virtues and vices. Thus Aristotle observes that the, brand, the brave man appears rash relatively to the collar and cowardly relatively to the rash man. He thinks that this can happen because the opposition of the extremes to each other is more noticeable than their opposition to the mean. He also offers another explanation in terms of our tendency to view things at one end of the range as better or worse than those at the other, such as pleasures, leading us to think self-indulgence is more contrary to temperance than insensitivity to pleasure. As a consequence, Aristotle says, we describe as contrary to the mean that rather the directions in which we more often go to great lengths, and therefore self-indulgence, which is an excess, is more contrary to temperance. Not satisfied yet with his argument about the confusing of extremes with means, Aristotle attacks it from a different angle in chapter nine, here he points out that finding the mean is not always an easy matter. We're looking for the right rule that he introduced back in chapter two. In this context, he observes, for of the extremes, one is more erroneous, one less so. Therefore, since to hit the mean is hard in the extreme, we must, as a second best, as people say, take the least of the evils. We need then to go through a process of approximating to the mean until, until we finally hit upon it. Even this is not an easy task. Hence, a person who deviates little from goodness is not blamed, whether he does so in the direction of the more or the less, but only the man who deviates more widely, for he does not fail to be noticed. So the whole problem lies in discovering how far a person must deviate from the mean to be seen as blameworthy. It's not a matter of pure speculative reasoning, but of observation, and thus of a practical judgment of prudence. These points about courage found in book two 
of the Nicomachae of Ethics are introductory in nature and are offered to illustrate, to illustrate Aristotle's thinking about moral virtues in general. They reveal important aspects of courage, but they do not paint the full picture. For that, we need to delve into chapters six through nine in book three. The earlier chapters of that book are concerned with voluntary versus involuntary action, as Aristotle makes the case that the virtues are really voluntary. Once he establishes that claim, he moves on to consider the virtues of the irrational parts of humans, namely courage and temperance, which address respectively the feelings of fear and confidence and those of pleasure and pain. He doesn't consider them part of the intellectual life. Since courage and temperance are intertwined as cardinal virtues, we will eventually need to understand how the exercise of the virtue of temperance, or the lack thereof, modifies the exercise of courage. So in book three, chapter six, we find out what fears he thinks courage meets. The first issue he raises about courage is the sorts of things we fear, namely all terrible, evil things. Among these he lists disgrace, poverty, disease, friendlessness, and death. He immediately clarifies that some are right or even noble to fear, and that he notes that someone who fears disgrace is good and modest, and one who does not is shameless. Those who are, those are not terms proper to courage, but people perceive a similarity between the modest person and the brave, since both display forms of fearlessness. But it is not the fearlessness proper to the brave person. That kind is what the person demonstrates who stands his ground in the face of the most terrible evil of all, death. And not just any death, but specifically death in battle, which Aristotle declares the noblest. He says, properly then, he will be called brave who is fearless in face of a noble death and of all emergencies that involve death and the emergencies of war are in the highest degree of this kind. Not surprisingly, Aristotle points out that a person could be a coward in battle and still demonstrate confidence or self-assurance about losing money, perhaps. Meanwhile, a person who fears insult to his wife or children is not therefore a coward, but a person who is not fearful when about to be flogged is not brave because he's not confronting death, but merely pain. Again, I think that's a, mis a mistake, but this, I'm just telling you what Aristotle says. Even confronting some forms of death other than in battle uh, can count as courageous, but not all. <coughs> in chapter seven, uh, about courage and its extremes, we find uh, he opens with the acknowledgement that while not all are terrified by the same things, there are some things that are terrible even beyond human strength, and so every sensible man is terrified by them. When it comes to things not beyond human strength, the brave person will fear them but face them for honor's sake. What's important in this regard is that the degree of fear experienced by different sorts of faults that people commit. He says, of the faults that are committed, one consists in fearing what one should not, another in fearing what we should not, another in fearing when we should not, and so on. The man then who fears the right things and from the right motive and in the right way and at the right time and who feels confidence under the corresponding conditions is brave. For the brave man feels and acts according to the merits of the case and in whatever way the rule directs. So why does the brave person act this way? Aristotle's explanation is that it is for a noble end that the brave man endures and acts as courage directs. 
In other words, courage is noble. This point can't be stressed enough. The various faults of courage always represent a purpose, an end that is not truly noble, or not pursued because it is noble. The intention is defective, and the defects are numerous because so many other vices can be at play. Whatever the mixture, the result will not be true courage. We'll see more about that shortly. The faults, then, will be less than noble ranging from excess of confidence, for which he has no name, but we can call it audacity, or more commonly the word rashness, to fear, of, to excess of fear, which is termed cowardice. The rash person, though, is likely to be boastful. And as Aristotle, a pretender, as the brave man is with, with, with regard to what is terrible, so the rash man wishes to appear. So he imitates him in situations where he can. A contemporary issue we might think of is the crime of stolen valor. Aristotle makes the powerful suggestions that most of these people are a mixture of rashness and cowardice. That is a key to understanding a lot of what he is driving at, and that which he, we also often overlook. The coward fears both what he ought not and as he ought not. Fearing everything, the coward is despairing, unlike the brave who is hopeful. Another contrast is that rash men are precipitate and wish for dangers beforehand, but draw back when they're in them while brave men are keen in the moment of action, but quiet beforehand. The point to keep in mind is that the brave person fears what and as and when one ought, and remains assured that the object of fear can be countered by standing firm, because that is the noble thing to do, or at least because it would be base or ignoble not to do so. The chapter ends with a clarification that is essential, <coughs> but to die, to escape from poverty or love or anything painful is not the mark of a brave man, but rather of a coward. For it is softness to fly from what is troublesome, and such a man endures death not because it is noble, but to fly from evil. too many times. So here we are, these five kinds of pseudo-courage. He introduces us to ways in which the label courage gets misapplied. Some of Aristotle's observations will be surprising, if not troubling. We'll see just how uh, very strictly Aristotle limits the idea of courage to that which is done for the sake of nobility as such. The first example he offers is the case of the citizen soldier. Closest to true courage is the participation in combat of the citizen soldier. In Aristotle's Athens, citizens, that is, free males who could engage in legislating, were expected to make themselves available in times of armed conflict. The problem is that there were legal penalties and reproaches of other citizens for failure to participate that a person would want to avoid, as well as honors they might want to win by doing their duty. Since such motives can hardly, I'm sorry, can readily be involved, it's not assured that the people who engage in military action do so solely for noble reasons. Still, Aristotle is willing to admit that they may well act from some other virtue not, though not pure courage. While shame is not a virtue in itself, it is related to modesty, which is praiseworthy. Hence, the avoidance of shame, as well as the desire for honor, and the avoidance of disgrace, lead to the citizen soldier's actions being compared with those of the brave person. 
at another removed from true courage would be those who are compelled to fight by their rulers because they do so uh, not to avoid shame but from fear of punishment. Nor do they act to avoid disgrace but to avoid what is painful. <coughs> Anyone who acts out of compulsion is not truly brave or courageous. Once more, Aristotle drives home the basic point, but one ought to be brave, not under compulsion, but because it is noble to be so. The second kind, the assurance of expertise. Action based on experience and knowledge gained from it can look like courage also. For example, professional soldiers seem to be brave to those who do not know the skills the soldier has acquired by training or his ability to use arms effectively. But even they can be overwhelmed by fear when the danger seems too great or when they perceive that they are outnumbered or under-equipped. Aristotle notes that the citizen soldier will die at the front while the professional abandons the field and flees. The latter entered the battle assuming their superiority and relying on their experience. But when they come to recognize that the facts are different from their expectations, he says, they flee, fearing death more than disgrace. But the brave man is not that sort of person. Third example, uh, the force of emotion. A third pseudo-courage is found in people who act out of passion or powerful emotion. As Aristotle describes them, they are like wild beasts rushing at those who have wounded them. The mistake about them happens because brave people are passionate, but their emotion is not the sole or ultimate cause of their action. Rather, it accompanies and strengthens their pursuit of honor. The brave do not rush into danger without foreseeing peril. They are not driven by pain or passion. Those who are driven by such feelings are simply rash. When people respond to anger by seeking revenge, they are not at all brave. Aristotle condemns them in these words. Those who fight for these reasons, however, are pugnacious, but not brave. For they do not act for honor's sake, nor as the rule directs, but from strength of feeling. The mistaken judgment about these people, or that these people are brave, results from not recognizing the central importance of honor as the motive for bravery, or for courage. That motive is internal. What people see is just the external exercise of strength and force. And people are easily impressed, even if the use of force is of a violent nature. Not knowing what true courage is about, they're easily misled. In our times, we might think of the behavior of members of street gangs. I'll talk about them later. The self-deception uh, deception of the sanguine personality comes next. It concerns the sanguine person, the person who is cheerful, warm, passionate, and confident. For Aristotle, their self-assurance in the face of danger is not like that of the truly brave, but simply derives from having conquered often against many foes. They, they think they are the strongest and can suffer nothing. He added a comment that drunken men are also behave in this way, to make clear his disdain. They quickly run away when things do not go as they expect, Again, the actions of the sanguine person flow not from the intent to do what is noble, but to display their mere self-confidence. Think today of the person who intends to impress others with their swagger. Fifthly, the ignorant fool. The final category of the pseudo-courageous is occupied by those who are simply ignorant of danger. Though superficially similar to the sanguine, they lack self-reliance, and when they grasp the facts of which they were ignorant, they quickly take flight. Even if for a moment they might have appeared brave, they simply and swiftly display their cowardice. Once more, although Aristotle does not repeat it here, the pursuit of the most noble and most honorable is totally absent. 
so there could be no question of true courage in this category of people. Chapter 9 gives a summation. Now I go there. Uh, and he makes some concluding remarks emphasizing the most important points. Courage, he reminds us, is courage and is concerned with feelings of assurance and fear, but not equally. It's the person who stands firm in the face of things that inspire fear that is courageous, rather than the one who is confronted with things that inspire confidence. The brave person, then, faces what is painful, not for the sake of pain, but because it is noble to do so, or vile not to. The next remark takes us back to the issue that overarches Aristotle's thought on courage. The more he is possessed of virtue in its entirety, and the happier he is, the more he will be pained at the thought of death, for life is best worth living for such a man, and he is knowingly losing the greatest goods, and this is painful. But he is nonetheless brave, and perhaps all the more so, because he chooses noble deeds of war at that cost. This emphasis on noble deeds of war opens a question about what other deeds might count as noble. Surely Aristotle is clear that the soldier can be courageous, but can anyone else? And further, is the courage of the soldier on the battlefield a guarantee that that virtue will be present in his actions of it? Courage, after all, is one of the cardinal virtues. Why should it be restricted in its application to such a narrow slice of life? Perhaps a word you know, is in order here about Aristotle, what Aristotle calls noble. He clearly thinks the deeds of war are noble. He also makes the point in discussing liberality, what we would call today generosity, that virtuous actions are noble and done for the sake of the noble. Just a few paragraphs earlier, he had completed his discussion of temperance and had remarked that the appetitive element in temperance uh, should harmonize with the rational principle. For the noble is the mark at which both aim, and the temperate man craves for the things he ought, as he ought, and when he ought, and this is what the rational principle directs. From this one must defer that whatever is done according to the direction of the rational principle must also be regarded as noble. Still, in the background, there is an inevitable hint of elitism. Aristotle never loses sight of the difference between the well-born, the noble, and the low-born. The Greek word for nobleness is eugenia, well-born, or good genes. In ancient Athens, these would have been the people who were citizens, members of the ruling class, the legislators, the judges in the court. In short, people who were expected to exercise their rationality in guiding the life of the city-state. In Aristotle's experience, these would have been the people who had the leisure to develop the virtues, in contrast with the low-born, the deans, the demos who were trapped in physically demanding occupations, leaving them no time for the refined interest, interests of the high board, the life of the mind, and were led by their emotions rather than by rationality. The contrast between activities in which people got their hands dirty and those which were clean was ingrained in Athenian social consciousness. The high board could, of course, practice arts such as music and poetry, but sculpture was highly suspect because of its physical demands and the dusty byproducts. It was not that low, dirty occupations such as shipbuilding or agriculture did not have their own standards of excellence, arete, this very word we translate as virtue, but those were different. They had nothing directly to do with moral excellence. When Aristotle repeatedly insists on the pursuit of the noble, we must keep these Ath Athenian attitudes in mind. It's an ele element of such importance in Aristotle's thought that we really need to revise the definition of virtue, which he presented back in Book 2, Chapter 6. 
That in virtue then is a state of character concerned with choice lying in a mean, that is the mean relative to us, the, this being determined by a rational principle and by that principle by which a man of practical wisdom would determine it. We need to qualify choice by revising it to say choice made in pursuit of the noble. It might also help to point out that the phrase relative to us, again, doesn't mean subjectively, but relative to us as human beings, objectively grounded in our human reality. Another point that needs emphasis is the formula that Aristotle invokes at several points to discover what the rational principle to establish the right rule is. We recall that in Book 3, Chapter 7, he tells us, the man then who faces and who fears the right things and from the right motive and in the right way and at the right time and who feels confidence under the corresponding conditions is brave. For the brave man feels and acts according to the merits of the case and in whatever way the rule directs. We saw that same formula earlier invoked in Book 3, Chapter 12 with respect to temperance. So also in the discussion of liberality in Book 4, Chapter 1, and in the related vices identified by the ways in which they fail on one or more of those points. Similarly, we find the same claim being made about magnificence in Chapter 2, about pride in Chapter 3, and good temper in Chapter 5. It's the framework, then, for Aristotle's understanding of how right reason directs virtuous actions in all the moral errors, areas of life. It might have been obvious that the entire discussion of courage was concerned with one of the two irrational parts of the human person, namely the irascible, uh, arousable appetite. We may speculate that given his cultural background, he thought that courage would be a, of leading interest for his audience. So when he comes to discuss the other appetite, the concupiscible, the desirous appetite, and its virtue, temperance, we might notice that there just might be something more basic to which the irascible appetite responds with fear or confidence, and so on. The account that Aristotle offers uh, in Book 3 is less detailed than that that he gives to courage. So what kind of a mean, then, is temperance? It's a mean with regard to pleasures and principally bodily ones, as opposed to those of the soul, such as honor or love of learning. But even among bodily pleasures, not all are viewed as objects of self-indulgence. Aristotle suggests that delights of hearing and telling stories, listening to music, beholding colors and shapes, or finding enjoyment in aromas are not susceptible to self-indulgence. Again. I'm not so sure. Um, it is only when these are linked to the pleasures of taste and touch that they can be related to the self-indulgence of the intemperate person. The source of moral reprobation lies not so much in the pleasures involved, but in the fact that the intemperate person indulges in the kinds of pleasures other animals share in, which therefore appear slavish and brutish. The self-indulgent employ the tastes and touch involved in food, drink, and sexual intercourse, not for the healthy purposes of these things, but for the pleasurable sensations themselves. Aristotle is clear that non-human animals do not perceive, pursue the pleasures of these senses, except incidentally in the pursuit of food. It's not that they are self-indulgent. What makes the self-indulgent human blameworthy lies simply in treating the sensations that are common to other animals in ways not proportioned to humanity. That is to say, not respecting the rule of reason mentioned earlier. This sets the scene for Aristotle to return once more to cowardice where he contrasts it with self-indulgence. The basis for this con contrast is that self-indulgence is roused by pleasures whereas cowardice is elicited by anticipated pain. 
For Aristotle, this means that self-indulgence is more voluntary than cowardice, and thus more a matter of reproach. The degree of voluntariness in cowardice is different, and its acts may even seem to be done under compulsion. The acts of the self-indulgent person, though, are voluntary, for he does them with craving and desire, Aristotle says. But the whole state is less so, for no one craves to be self-indulgent. His words, not mine. We might wonder at the accuracy of that last remark in view of some of the more exaggerated and exotic forms of self-indulgence we witness today, but for present purposes, we leave that for some other discussion. In book five, we come to justice. For the sake of having a more com complete picture, Aristotle's understanding of the cardinal virtues uh, calls for consideration of what justice is. He notes at the outset that the word justice uh, and injustice are ambiguous, but can possibly be resolved by taking a closer look at one of the contraries. He begins by asking what the meanings of the phrase an unjust man might be, since people who are lawless, grasping, or unfair are all considered unjust. The meaning of just must be the lawful and the fair. <coughs> Being law-abiding, then, captures a central portion of what it is to be just, while being a lawbreaker is to be unjust. Thus, Aristotle insists, the laws in their enactments on all subjects aim at the common advantage either of all or of the best or of those who hold power or something of the sort. So that in one sense we call those acts just that tend to produce and preserve happiness and its components for the political society. And the law bids us to do both the acts of a brave man, for example, not to desert our post, nor to take flight, uh, nor to throw away our arms, and those of a, a temperate man, for example, not to commit adultery, nor to gratify one's lust, and those of a good-tempered man, for example, not to strike another, nor to speak evil, and similarly with regard to the other virtues and forms of wickedness, commanding some acts and forbidding others. And the rightly framed law does this rightly, and the hastily conceived one less well. Uh, in today's world, uh, few people think that that's the purpose of government. Mm -hmm. But that's clear for Aristotle. He goes on to declare that this complete justice in relation to our, is in relation to our neighbor. In this sense, he claims that it is not part of justice, but virtue entire. A discussion ensues of justice as a part of virtue having two aspects. The first of these is what in modern times we call distributive justice. The other he terms rectificatory. He sums up the nature of distributive justice by stating that this then is what the just is, the proportional, the unjust is what violates the proportion. What Aristotle had in mind was the distribution of honor or money or the other things that fall, fail, that fall to be divided among those who have a share in the Constitution. For in these it is possible for one man to have a share either unequal or equal to that of another. The nature of rectificatory or corrective justice involves an arithmetical proportion of commensurable worth between two individuals who engage in transactions, whether voluntary or involuntary. The voluntary ones we might deem acts of commutative justice, such as sales, loans, leases, and so on, while the involuntary include thefts, adultery, poisoning, false witness, even assaults, murder, mutilation, abuse, and insult. Any of these we might group uh, together under retributive justice in modern terminology. So, let's see here. Get the right one. So, general observations now on Aristotle's thought. He has much to say about other virtues and vices, but this isn't the place to explore them. We should attend to some aspects of his presentation of courage, temperance, and justice 
that may obscure the recognition of pseudo-courage or false courage in our times, even when there are elements of insight that we may draw upon to identify and account for them. We've noticed already the point of departure for Aristotle's discussion of courage is the importance of bravery in combat in a society that was strongly militaristic and had serious expectations of citizen participation in defense of the city-state. In that context, we should not be surprised that Aristotle considered the highest, most noble form of courage to be found in facing the prospect of imminent death on the battlefield. Still, a byproduct of this focus is that other objects of fear are only briefly hinted at. He did recognize fear of loss of honor as a significant challenge to courage, but he seems not to have thought about the example raised by Constant View of the confrontation with something worse than death, unending suffering, prolonged horror, both immediate and terribly present. We can grant that threats to, in the physical realm are likely to generate a powerful response of self-defense, but even Aristotle's case of honor is not in the realm of the physical. This suggests that we need to think about a wider range of potential attacks one might face that would call for courage. One might think, for example, about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, even though, frankly, there is no empirical support for that, but is popularly known, so I extend, use that. It has an extended form that includes a few extra things that the original list, list didn't. What Aristotle to be be the, took to be the principal fear was in the safety category, though one might also set it in the physiological category since the danger of death looms over one's total physical integrity. The fear of disgrace or loss of honor, Aristotle uh, discusses, would fall in the category of esteem. Even the five examples of pseudo-courage that he points out can be related to one or another of Maslow's categories. The citizen soldier, may start courageously, but be overwhelmed in the face of battlefield slaughter, would fit into the physiological category. The highly trained warrior who appears courageous on the outside actually has displaced fear by expertise in the cognitive category, at least until the training falls short of an immediate need and cowardice takes over. The fighter driven by emotion who also seems courageous to others, really operates from the need for social acceptance. And both those who seem at first courageous because of self-deception or ignorance rush to danger out of a need for esteem in the form of attention from others. What these, these connections show is that the very failures of courage that Aristotle wrote about can be seen as arriving, arising from fears of forces that he overlooked in his stress on battlefield death. We can build on what we found in Aristotle to try to offer an account of behaviors in our contemporary world that also flow from failures of courage, often made to seem courageous by the same kinds of misunderstandings that the people of Aristotle's time were guilty of. In this address, it will not be possible to identify every such behavior, but by examining some fairly familiar examples, we might be able to stimulate further discussion and perhaps shift our perceptions about who is truly courageous. So, so failures of courage exposed. Yes. So, let me begin with a behavior that we might all have heard of and perhaps have even engaged in ourselves, namely road rage. The perpetrator feels justified in acting dangerously because another driver has threatened the perpetrator's sense of control by disrespecting the perpetrator's need to accomplish the goal of arriving at their destination according to their own plan. The other driver is guilty of disrupting the perpetrator's day and deserves to be punished. From within the pr protective cocoon of that vehicle, the perpetrator is driving, a weapon of mass destruction after all. A show of bravado threatening the other driver seems like a brave, courageous action to take. How many other lives may be put in danger is not their concern. 
The perpetrator is certain the action displays their courage for the whole world to see as they humiliate the other driver for their offensive misdeed. What we can notice is that the perpetrator is actually acting out of a web of fears, not resisting them as a truly courageous person would. Courage, after all, meets fear with reason, not simply passionate response. In this instance, that would be to attend more carefully to driving safely. By a display of rage, the perpetrator yields to the fear of loss of esteem, loss of self-respect, loss of control, and engages in a cowardly behavior that is meant to have the appearance of courage, an example of Aristotle's courageous-looking coward. Another sort of example is found in the daredevil motorcycle stunt driver. The individual may begin with small stunts, perhaps jumping over a couple cars. What's the point? Could it be another instance of seeking attention, affirmation from others in exchange for a shiver of danger as the motorcycle rises into the air? It cannot be that there is any practical need to take that kind of risk to life and limb. But as time goes on and the driver attempts more and more risky stunts, there may be a growing sense of expertise that leads the driver to seek louder ovations from adoring spectators. The driver's boldness produces, again, an appearance of bravery. And the day arrives when a sort of addiction to the thrill of danger blinds the driver to the limits of the equipment and the accumulated skills and a major leap in scale beckons. I have to show that I can jump the width of the Grand Canyon. The fear of going without the roar of the crowd, the adulation of admiring fans, and all the trappings of fame and possibly even fortune prevail. Those fears have never been assuaged by years of stunts. All comes to a disastrous end when the final jump turns into a disaster. The hollowness of fear that underlay the boldness through the years raises questions in the minds of the fans, but they likely fail to see that what they had been witnessing was only a veneer of bravery, hiding the pain of unresolved fears of psychological threats. Cowardice once more masquerading as bravery, exactly what Constantville called the courage of the daredevil. Thirdly, the schoolyard or any bully affords another case of cowardice. Whatever may be the origins of the bully's neediness, the kinds of deficiencies are similar to the previous examples. The bully is desperately afraid that others in their little world may not provide enough recognition, status, and acceptance. They try to display strength and bravery by identifying others who seem weak in some way or another, size, for example, or physical skills, or any number of cues the bully looks for that make the other vulnerable to threats or even attacks. The bully may deploy a range of emotional, verbal, or physical resources to manipulate or coerce their targets, thereby giving the bully a sense of mastery or control. Force violence are ever at hand to furnish the bully with a false sense of power. This may even exert they may even exert financial threats, coercing their targets to turn over their lunch money. When the bully meets with no resistance, new targets can be found to expand the sense of domination and control. Each target conquered still leaves the bully with a need for more. The fear of emptiness, of being an outsider, does not go away. The bully trades a sense of power over others for actually belonging to a group of welcoming others. The bluster and swagger of bullies leave them in a position to be unwelcome in most social contexts, a self-defeating result indeed. Some form of forms of cowardice may have opportunities to break free but the bully is in a far narrower position with fewer chances of escape, short of careful re-education 
of their psychosocial expectations. These examples relate to school bully, but with adjustments for context, bullies continue their predatory behavior in adult life. While anyone in any position can engage in bully behavior, supervisors, managers, and executives are positioned for wielding power rather than authority. The same could be said in the world of politics, of course. On the present international scene, we only have to look at an example such as Vladimir Putin and his many admirers and imitators. Bullies all. A further note, it appears that phenomena such as racism and other forms of a supremacist ideologies, including religious ones, are either forms of or closely akin to the bully mentality. They can certainly offer pseudo-justifications and excuses for the actions of bullies. Fourth, street gang membership offers another interesting uh, instance to explore. The connection with bullies should be obvious since in all likelihood the gang leader would be a bully. So what motivates people to join a gang? We have to look once more to the fears that they are attempting to assuage. Often it's a longing to belong, that they uh, want to be accepted, to be protected. The, the individual, for whatever reason, real or imagined, feels excluded from, rejected by mainstream social groupings. They may have lost a sense of family attachment, of trust and acceptance from former friends or relatives, or even religious groups. Feeling already that they are outcasts a socially disreputable group such as a gang is attractive because it offers ersatz forms of all that seems lacking. The group cohesion, mutual support, and protection afforded by the gang substitute for safety and affection. The shared reliance on violence and coercion masks the individual's cowardly urges as the gang pursues its agenda to achieve recognition, fame, and status by controlling the streets of some neighborhood, if nowhere else. What we witness is a crowd of rash cowards lending one another reinforcement, mistakenly believing that they are actually brave. Those four examples that we just thought of, it suggests that Aristotle's own thoughts on forms of pseudo-courage where fear is not confronted with principled courage, but yielded to by cowardice masquerading as courage, can account for much of what is wrong with our societies today. It's simply a matter of broadening the list of fears that matter beyond death. We need to open our eyes to begin seeing other widespread examples and start tracing the roots of the problem. We would like to believe that those we call leaders are courageous. And some are, but not all. Those who are not must be identified and denounced as the craven cowards they actually are. We need to look for institutionalized forms of cowardice pretending to offer security. Consider for a moment the adoption in recent years of so-called stand-your-ground laws. They ignore the traditional moral norms of self-defense and shield from censure or prosecution cowards who use violence and even death on the ground that I feared for my life. Well, as Aristotle saw, such fear is precisely when courage is demanded. The courageous person does not use violence as a first, but only as a last resort. And even then, only in the least forceful degree possible. Consider, too, the fear-mongering that preoccupies our society. How many messages, particularly from electioneering politicians, are designed to raise fears of non-existent threats? Watch, too, the news reports, not content to announce late-breaking news about a local act of gun violence, but to exaggerate the incident, rehash not just past local events even, but others from distant locales. The distracted consumer can be misled to imagine that their own neighborhood is a nest of violent criminals. A world saturated with manufactured fear 
is a hothouse for cowardice, perhaps especially of the rash variety that Aristotle identified. This kind of misinformation can also lead fear-filled parents to infect their impressionable children with additional fears, and then instill a false sense of security by making firearms available to them. Who could think that letting a first grader get access to a gun so he could shoot his teacher is somehow a demonstration of courage? Courage is not a religious virtue that it should be a problem for separation of church and state. It is a necessity for a civic society. That was Aristotle's reasoning for putting it in his treatment of ethics. Our world needs to rediscover the essential role that courage has for everyone. Our society needs to become deliberate in infusing explicit training and courage into all our institutions. Arming teachers is no protection from violence in a world full of cowards. Arming our children with a solid commitment to courage is. Training our public servants of all kinds in their responsibility for courage is a guarantee of true patriotism and a sure defense against corruption. Instead of the Cold War era's search for commies in every corner, it's time for us to seek out, find, condemn, and wipe out every failure of courage we can. Cowardice must not rule our world. I hope I got the right one. I did it. <laughs> so, there we are. Uh, if anyone happens to have a few questions, uh, we've got some people with some slips of paper and even a pencil or two uh, that you can write your question down. Uh, we take a brief moment and I relax my voice for a second. that took a half hour longer than I expected it to. And it wasn't because I went so far off text. Well, here this first question is, I hope, fairly straightforward. Who said virtue is the middle road and is it? Well, the answer is Aristotle is the one that came up with that. Uh, and uh, if we understand that the road is wider than it may sound, uh, according to Aristotle, uh, then I think it is an accurate way of putting it. When he talks about that proportionate range of the, of the virtuous that shades off over into the extremes on one side or the other, I think we get a better sense of what he meant. Um, the, the, the kind of first uh, 
stab at it often leads people to think that it's a very, very narrow little spot that's right in the center of the road. But the road's wider and has some room for uh, variation. You know, as I pointed out, there is that possibility of the person who is not perfectly courageous, but courageous in some ways, and maybe just a little bit rash in others, and once in a while a little bit cowardly, without being just cowardly or just rash. So uh, I think we have to understand a, a kind of range there that is wider than sometimes uh, it's made to sound. Does that answer that? Let's see what else we've got. Uh, you mentioned temperance and self-control earlier. Is self-control synonymous with temperance in every instance? Uh, if it's true self-control, yes. Uh, self-control uh, that we're talking about, morally speaking, is the same thing as temperance. It's just that our, our modern terminology uh, is uh, a little different from uh, that of ancient times. Uh, Aristotle never uses any word other than the equivalent in Greek for temperance, but we translate it in different ways. So, yeah, it's, it is about self-control. And that means then that a person who lacks self-control can lack that in either direction, either in the direction of self-indulgence on the one side, or boorishness, as Aristotle calls it, on the other side. You can go either direction, and similarly with the other kinds of virtues. So self-control is going to be keeping us in that, that middle ground, which as I say, is wider than people sometimes imagine. Let's see here, what else have we got? How to face the charge of elitism regarding the cultivation of virtue. For Aristotle, virtues were uh, more accessible to elites. Today, developmental and socioeconomic issues uh, may remain, uh, may render it difficult to resist cultivation of cowardice or fearful temperament, uh, living under stress, for instance. And I agree that that is a, a, a problem of our time. That, faces us differently from the society that Aristotle lived in. Uh, for Aristotle, though, uh, the, uh, the lines between the different parts of society were much deeper and set than they are for us. In, in our world, we think of the possibility of mobility uh, in uh, life that you may be born poor and become uh, very wealthy, or vice versa. It can go in either direction. In Aristotle's world, that was just not dreamt of. The, uh, the poor person was always going to be poor. There was really no hope for getting out of that. Uh, and so this, the citizens, who were not the residents, but just as people who had the uh, prerogative of participating in government. Those were the only ones that mattered. They, they were the elites. And that is, again, quite different from our time in which, you know, even if you're not particularly wealthy, you could say, be elected mayor of a town or something and become involved in governmental activity that would again have been just unheard of in Aristotle's time. So, but, but this is, the writer of this is correct that we today face uh, different kinds of issues that may still render it difficult uh, to, res to resist the cultivation of colonists. And that may be part of the, uh, of the problem um, 
yesterday some of us were discussing the question about uh, the unwillingness of people to make sacrifices uh, for the sake of the common good. And uh, I, th I think it falls under the same heading of a lack of courage about one's own point of view, one's own preferences, one's own uh, ideology, or whatever. That people are not willing to see the possibility that by yielding a little bit here or a little bit there, the common good might be enhanced and pursued more effectively. Uh, I think that's important for us to recognize. And we seem to be in a, in a time when, again, there is a fear connected with that. The fear of compromise uh, that arises out of a fear of loss of identity with a preferred group of membership. Not unlike the person who wants to join the gang. To have that sense of being together with, with like-minded people. But the unwillingness to step outside one's comfort zone is a kind of uh, act that may seem brave and courageous to a person, but it's driven by something less than noble. Aristotle would call it cowardly. I think, we, I think we should recognize that. You spoke a lot about physical courage. What about moral courage, especially in today's political environment? Well, I think what I was just saying uh, at least touches on uh, where I think some of those difficulties lie. Um, we, we seem to be in a political environment that uh, wants to create silos in which people hear what they want to hear and they're afraid to get out of those to hear what anybody else might have to say. Again, for fear of losing some sense of identification with that group. And, uh, and that becomes a a serious threat to our, uh, our whole democratic uh, world. The, uh, the, the basic idea of democracy, uh, unlike in Aristotle's time, by the way, because a democracy in his time would have been a, the rule of that, that bottom class that had no clue about much of anything other than how to do their own job. Um, so, uh, but our understanding of democracy is something that requires continual discussion and rational discourse. And without rational discourse, which is also respectful discourse, you are going to continue to risk the, uh, the replacement of democracy with various forms of totalitarianism. We see that uh, in a couple of European countries where uh, a despot gets popularly elected to their position and then from that position makes it impossible for anyone else but that person and those who are in their little circle of supporters to stay in power or to get in power. So, so that is a, a serious problem. Uh, there are books being written on that problem, uh, by the way. Uh, again, not, not just, for example, in the United States, but for the whole world. Uh, you can see the, uh, the kinds of triumphs of that mentality, uh, say in, uh, I mentioned Vladimir Putin, but also in Xi Jinping, 
uh, and in uh, Kim Jong-un, and all of those de uh, despots who are ruling, claiming to have been elected freely, but there is nothing free about their elections and their electoral process. If you automatically jail all of the people that might oppose you, you can hardly call it a free election. So I think that is a, a serious concern, which again calls for true courage. And the uh, understanding of courage widely uh, spread throughout our institutions, our personal lives, and so on. Courage is not going to be enough practiced as a private matter. It must be a practice that all of us engage in. One more question. How would you teach courage? <coughs> what does that curriculum look like? Well, uh, I think it depends on uh, the uh, age range that we're talking about. Uh, I, I think in some respects uh, we have to begin early uh, in the lowest grades and try to communicate that bullying behavior isn't acceptable and show why and explain what the fears are that are displayed by the bully. You know, and certainly bullying goes on uh, in lots of schools. You know, I, I use the phrase, uh, why do we teach our children cowardice? Uh, and partly out of an experience that I had back when I was a pastor, uh, and there was, well, I'll think of one, uh, there were more than one, but there, were, there was one major bully. Um, and as uh, we explored the situation, it turned out that he was being encouraged by both of his parents to behave that way. Because that's what, how you show that you're strong. And this is a nine-year-old. Why do they think that that is what strength is about? Why do they think that self-control isn't stronger and isn't true courage? True courage goes with self-control. So I think to a very great extent, uh, children need to have it pointed out to them quite clearly at an early age that bullying behavior is a sign of weakness, a sign of fearfulness, a sign of an inability to control your fears. Right? That's where it needs to start. And as children age, and the range of their possible uh, expressions and interactions uh, in terms of courage uh, widens, they need to be told, it needs to be explained, it needs to be demonstrated how some kinds of actions represent true courage and other ones don't. You know, they, they need to be become aware that resort to violence is itself a piece of failure of courage. It's not all there is, but resorting to violence is a sure sign of an inability to confront a fear in a rational way. You know, we used to hear the phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword. Today, I don't think there are very many people who would believe that. And maybe that in itself is something where we have to help people 
rediscover traditional understandings about strength and weakness. So all through life and on into uh, adult activities, as I suggested, in all of our institutions, whether that be government institutions, business institutions, whatever, we need to keep emphasizing the importance of courage. You know, in, in a business setting, it takes a great deal of courage to tell your boss that what they're proposing is immoral. Right? Somebody's got to say it. Somebody has to speak up and name that. And that is an act of courage that ought to be not only respected, but promoted and honored. So I think, you know, in terms of educating people in courage, those are the kinds of directions I would recommend. Uh, in trying to put a whole curriculum together, again, I, I think we have to be sensitive to what children at different ages can absorb, but there are efforts being written, being done now in the writing of children's books that promote uh, strength and courage and that discourage any kind of of bullying or uh, things like that. One more. How does the courage of discretion relate to courage? Ambiguously. Uh, discretion can be a very positive thing, but like a number of other sorts of behaviors, it can also provide a mask for evil, a protection for, uh, for grave evil. Think of discretion uh, as exercised by people who covered up sex abuse in the church. They thought they were being discreet. They didn't want to offend or give scandal and so on. That is not a virtue. That is a vice. So discretion is important when it truly protects virtues and important positive values. I, we, I use the phrase positive values because we forget that there are negative ones. People's sense of values can very, be very messy and there are negative values and unfortunately in the study of values uh, it turns out that nobody does any uh, scientific research on it. You, you don't hear uh, research being done uh, in, the, in the business world, for example, on the role of greed in the operation of a business. Greed, I'm sorry, is a vice. It is not a virtue. Uh, so, you know, like, like a number of other things, we, we have to think about uh, how we talk about virtues and values and so on in acknowledgement that sometimes things have multiple uses. If, uh, if my discretion is to protect the, uh, the life and safety of another person, that seems generally to be helpful. That's positive. <coughs> but if it's to protect somebody's reputation when their reputation ought not to be protected, then that is a vice. So again, it's an ambiguous connection. And maybe the, maybe the most courageous thing is for a person not to be lured into a false sense of virtue by being told they need to be discreet. They, again, they may need to stand up to that kind of challenge and say, that is wrong. 
well, I don't want to keep you here all night. Uh, that was the last question offered, so I wish you all a pleasant e evening, and please think about ways to promote courage uh, in your own uh, neighborhood, in your own life. In your life.